So we will have about five minutes divided between each of you. The first question is, what do you believe art can do to change how we address suicide? Uh, <clears throat> I think there's, there are two parts to that answer. One is like the stories of people that we got to interview who said very clearly that if one of the people we interviewed said, if I didn't pick up a guitar, if my mom didn't put a guitar in my hand, at the, I think at the age of 11, that he doesn't know that he would be alive today. Um, I think that's very important for people to be able to identify with something that gives them a passionate way to engage on the day to day, allows them to express themselves in ways that they might not feel comfortable or be supported in expressing themselves and brings them a sense of joy. And you know, for those of us who are not artists in, involved in creating art, I think music has been a really important source of inspiration for people to be able to draw from the lyrics of their favorite artists. So, you know, there's one of the people we interviewed had the lyrics of one of her favorite songs she's ever listened to tattooed on her arm, and it serves as something that centers her that she can go back to and, and reference. And so those are two ways I can think of art. Julie. Yeah, and then I would say uh, just exactly what Mike says. And, uh, and I would also talk about that um, stories are really powerful, right? We just heard Desiree's story, but, but Mike and I also listened to the stories of 14 people, and, and storytelling is an art. And when we have a shared experience listening to someone's story, we can carry that forward. And so what, um, what happens um, when I think of like how can art have power to change how we address a social issue, I think about the stories we carry and um, how we share those with others. So uh, on Saturday, I was at a gallery opening in Astoria, Oregon, a small gallery, interesting to talk to the people. And one of the paintings on the wall said, um, and it was by a woman uh, from here, from Portland, and, and the, the, her title was uh, for, Diane, uh, for Anthony Bourdain and his daughter, I think her name is Ariane. And I asked her about that, and she told me about her personal connection to Anthony Bourdain, um, even though she never met him, just that, that his, his work uh, as an, uh, a food activist, a world traveler, changed her profoundly, and his death affected her profoundly. And I, as we were talking, she said, what affected you in, that, in the stories you heard? And I said, when I listened to all of them, every one affected me. But when I think about Andrea's and that after she attempted suicide, she was jailed. And that is something most people don't realize, that that can still happen in our country, that you can be jailed for committing or for wanting to end your life. And that story is profound. I feel myself getting hot just thinking about it. And uh, it's important that we carry those stories forward. Thank you. Next question. And this is more personal. And I think especially given what we heard from Desiree, <coughs> we're really interested in hearing how did this project impact you after participating in the interviews and creating the portraits? I think. Uh, Listening to the stories of people who have been driven uh, to a place by the experiences that they've lived through that made them feel that their lives weren't worth living, um, that they, a sense of hopelessness that people described that they couldn't go on anymore. Uh, I related to that in my, my own struggles, you know, and to see that people had found ways to stay here and to continue being here is an incredibly powerful thing. You know, when we listen to the stories of people and the vulnerability and the courage that it takes for people to share things with us, you know, we're aware of the power that's being exchanged in that moment, and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So 
I was talking earlier about how when I, on the way from the interview, I'm listening to the radio, or when I get home, I see something in the media about a high profile suicide or drug overdose. These things happen often, but I'm always reflecting on the normal everyday people that are right next to us that struggle, that might not be famous, that you might not see on the front page of the paper if they so choose to end their lives. So I guess the stories of people who have continued to keep on, it just inspired me to reflect on what do I have in common with them? Um, can, I, can I be inspired when I'm in dark places by the stories of, of the people who participated? And I would say that uh, how it affected me is I, uh, I assumed that after listening to three stories uh, in a, on a beautiful afternoon in Portland, that I would need to go directly to my sister's house and grab my uh, two and a half year old nephew and take him for a walk and just be around um, joy or screaming tantrum or anything to get me out of my own head. But actually what I felt was enormous respect and hope and it, that, profound, that affected me in a way I, I did not expect. That I saw bravery, um, Mike and I witnessed it constantly. We saw uh, resilience, I saw hope um, in the, the people who brought um, somebody that supported them. I saw an amazing courage and um, love and friendship and laughter and all those things uh, they just affected me profoundly, you know, uh, realizing that, that in my brain, everything flipped. I wasn't feeling uh, like, I, I definitely felt compassion, but I felt, um, I felt that the work we were doing was gonna make a difference. I think that's the best thing I can say, is that, that that's what changed in me. Thank you very much. Audience, any questions from you? Do we have uh, cards? Cards. There's, Nina. There's one there. <clears throat> what common threads did you find amongst all or several of the survivors? Who wants to take that question? I think uh, a lot of childhood trauma and abuse, people who before they had uh, a full understanding of life, people who had been made to feel like they're, they weren't worth the life that they were given by people who took advantage of them and abused them, I found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was a, a certainly a common thread, and also realizing at what young age people first started mm. to think about it, and that was another common thread that I think was, I work a lot with children, and so does Mike, and I think it was really, I think it was, it was powerful for me, and I'm sure for Mike, but it, I think it's also powerful to let other people know, uh, especially educators, that the children you're teaching could be thinking of this as young as six, in a rare instance, and quite often at 12. That's a really common thread. 11 and 12 is a very common thread. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have a question. Thank you. Is the suicide rate consistent across socioeconomic strata, or is it more common in certain groups? I actually do not know, but that's a, a question that I wondered about because when you look at the participants and ask the question, everybody that responded is white and it's mostly women, but we know that there are people outside of that demographic who struggle, but we, that's just not who showed up for this project. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about that because you, as far as, I, 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 I know that it was, it was advertised far and wide. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we know because Mike and I were going to Hillsboro when we were going out here to Oregon City and every place sort of in the Tri-County area, it felt like. And 
I, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, you try, but why are only white people telling us their story? So I, I, I think that's one thing that we both were um, trying to think about why, where the silence comes from. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? Oh, we do. Thank you. Why is suicide prevention not interested in giving a dignified and graceful option to exit life using nonviolent methods like euthanasia? Hmm. Is that a question that you feel that you could speak to? I just think that's a really interesting question. That's a question I don't, I mean, I, I had to consider that when my mother, you know, was dying of cancer, but it's not something I actually walk around thinking about on a regular basis. I would, I would almost be curious to see what whoever mm -hmm. posed that question has to say about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think we're going to end this section with one more question for you and Julie, Mike, which is, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't talked about tonight? Uh, just, you know, going back to the first, one of the first things I said, we, I have a job not to fuck up young people's lives to the point where they want to die. And we, we all have that job. <laughs> I, I, uh... <laughs> uh, that, that was something that I think you said to somebody during an interview. And we, I just remember we were all laughing, like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, like, that's one common thread we're all learning here is uh, to really be kind to children uh -huh. and to listen to children. I think that is, like, I, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but we do, I, I, I think we both want to um, deeply acknowledge and thanks thank you guys for thinking that this was a worthwhile project to get involved in and also to thank every participant and their person of support and their families and friends thank uh, you all. it was amazing yeah. yes yeah.